Glad you're here. So last week, so the course we're in is relationships. And um, last week we talked about toolbox relationships. And I took 1 Corinthians 13 and broke that down and into elements. Today we're talking about when relationships fail. Uh, so before diving into this, um, let me open us in a word of prayer. Lord God, we, uh, uh, I know I often come to Sunday service with the happy face on and trying to pretend everything's all right, Lord, but you know very well it's not always that way. And, uh, you know, particularly in the area of our relationships, uh, we get hurt, we do things to hurt others, Lord, and things go astray. But Lord, um, you have a plan, and your plan is for us to thrive and to enjoy life to its fullest, Lord. So open up your word to us today. Help us interact with us, Lord. Talk with us. Teach us. Help us to see, even in the midst of um, in, uh, hardship and sorrow, Lord, how, how your reality, your joy, your peace can be very real to us. In thy name we pray. Amen. So, um, uh, I think everyone knows me, but in case you don't, I'm an elder here. I'm also a psychologist. Uh, and so, a lot of this stuff um, comes from firsthand interaction. Also, a lot of stuff that um, uh, I'm learning. And because uh, you're learning, right? But uh, I, I thought about this story, um, a very interesting story. A friend of mine, who's also a Christian therapist, said that a guy came to him. And his marriage was on the rocks. And he said, uh, the fellow said to my, my friend, the therapist, he goes, I would do anything to save my marriage. And my friend said to him, don't say that. And he's like, why? Why, why wouldn't I say that? He goes, because if you would do anything, that means you probably put things, you probably do things that might put um, your marriage between you and God. And God would never bless anything that would put uh, a division between you and him, all right? So think of that, right? If our purpose in life is uh, to love God and to, and to feel his presence and his love, it wouldn't make any sense for God to put something between, that would create a wedge between the two of you, even a marriage, right? It's kind of like when you, um, well, when you talk about uh, people getting married and they're having kids, right? You say, now it's very important you put your marriage in front of your kids, right? Because a lot of people put the kids in front of the marriage, right? But if you put the kids in front of the marriage and often the marriage falls apart, now that doesn't do the kids any good, right? But if you put the marriage before the kids and you got a good solid foundation of a marriage in the family, then that benefits the kids. Or maybe even, even more basic, right? Let me tell you on an airplane, when a plane goes down, put your mask on first and then put your kids on, right? You got to get your priorities right and things first, first right? So, in life, we have to put our relationship with God before everything else. If we have that foundation, then that's the strength for everything else that we do. Or as it says in Psalm 73, Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. Now, let's just dwell on that statement for a second. And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Now, if we're, if we're truthful, that, that's probably not a true statement for us, right? There are probably other things on life that we desire besides God, and sometimes we desire them more than God, which is what gets us into trouble. But that is our baseline, to use clinical terms. That is what should be. If we desire him so much that nothing else matters, then anything can happen to us and we'll be okay, Right? And so why aren't we okay when things happen to us? Because there are things that we desire besides God, all right? But that's okay. God knows that. He's got a plan, all right? So let's go back to uh, uh, marriages, right? The, the epitome of relationships, right? Why did God create them, all right? Now, First Genesis 26 to 28, uh, for the sake of time, I highlight, I'm going to go through the highlighted things here, but go back and read the passages and, and, and dwell on them later. But it said, God said, let us, sign of the Trinity right there in creation, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God is saying to 
him, and remember Trinity, there's a community. God is one, but his Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So they have a little community going on, right? And they say to one another, let's expand our community and let's make mankind in our likeness, right? Why? To rule over the fish and the sea and the birds, okay? So we see two purposes, right? One is to reflect the image of God. That's the purpose of us. And the second one is to rule over, right? And he ma made mankind his image. Then he created male and female, right? So he made ma male and female both in his image and put them together to be fruitful, increase, and then to rule over again, all right? So if we look at that, what is the purpose of marriage? Number one is that the wife and the husband, as a unit together, more fully reflect the image of God than they would individually, number one. Number two is that the husband and wife together as a unit can serve God's purposes better together than individually. Now, what's the flip side of the coin? Well, if the two, the man and the woman together, cannot reflect the image of God better and cannot serve his purposes more fully, then it'd be better to stay single. Now, does the scripture tell us that directly? Yeah. <laughs> Paul uh, in Corinthians says, Now, to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried. That's pretty clear. Okay, why? Okay, because you'd only be concerned with the affairs of the Lord. It's just you and God. All right, God, how do I serve you today? Right? If you're married, the married man has to please his wife, and his interests are divided. Right? It's true. Like, you wake up in the morning, okay, how do I make God happy? Well, how do I make my wife happy? Okay? Now, we hope you're asking it in that order, right? But both are your concerns. And the unmarried woman is devoted to the Lord, but a married woman has to please her husband. And, not to and he's saying this not to restrict you, but that you be undivided to the Lord. Okay? Again, that same theme. All right? So there's a purpose for marriage. All right? And it's not just so you'd have fun, right? Its purpose is that together, somehow, as a unit, you're reflecting the image of God uh, better than you would by yourself, and you're serving the purposes of God as a team, as a unit, better than you would yourself. And if that's not true, then what Paul's saying is, then stay single, right? Why am I bringing all this up? Because uh, maybe at times we, the church, over-glorify marriage, over-glorify relationships. And when they don't work, we make it like it's the end of the world, which it is not, okay? There's other purposes, like just serving God. You know, like, so maybe, sometimes, we may be making an idol of marriage. We have to see there's a purpose that marriage serves, and if it's serving that purpose for God, it's good. But if it's not, well, you don't need it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Therefore, if you were not serving God or reflecting his image better as a couple, you're better off living with God alone. Notice I didn't say you're better off living alone. You're better off living with God alone. Because that's often what happens when, I, when, I'm, when I'm counseling people say, you know, I, I just don't want to be alone. And it's, okay, good, don't be. Now, obviously that's easier said than done, right? But there is a trade-off, right? Because when you're in a relationship, as we just read in Scripture, you have to be concerned with the other person. So there's always that struggle between serving God and serving the other person and getting along with God, getting along with the other person. When you're by yourself, it's just that struggle is, okay, I feel alone, God, but I know you're with me. And you, so you have that struggle gone. So it's, you're trading one struggle for the other, but the bottom line is, when all is said and done, you're serving God. You're developing your relationship with God. You're developing your intimacy with Him either way, okay? So also know that marriage was not meant to be eternal. I know they may rock our world a little bit, but it wasn't. Matthew 22, it says, At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given into marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Do you remember that um, passage? In the, um, Cliff, you might remember which one of the Gospels. Where the Sadducees were trying to trick um, Jesus, you know. See, the, you had the Sadducees and the Pharisees. 
to, to Jewish leaders, right? And the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, that after death you'd be brought back to life, and the Sadducees did not, right? So the Sadducees were trying to trick Jesus, and they said, okay, if uh, a husband dies and his brother marries his widow, because that's what you did to honor, you know, the giver of family, right? And then that brother dies, and then the other brother marries, and this happens between seven brothers when they go to heaven in the resurrection, whose wife will they be, right? And basically Jesus says, okay, guys, <laughs> you're not reading your scripture, right? It's not going to be any marriage in heaven. Now think about that. So then this eternal... Our relationship with God has eternal worth, right? Now, we know we're not to give in to uh, riches and glories and titles uh, because we, that they're not going to last forever. You know the saying, you can't take it with you. you know? So we know that our riches and, and whatever wealth we obtain, you can't take it with you. And the bottom line is we're going to see God face to face. You're not going to take your marriage with you. You're not going to take your relationships with you. You're not going to take your boyfriend with you. You're not going to take that. We're, there's there's going to be this oneness that's going to supersede all that, which is just mind-boggling. Okay, So that also points to the fact that the marriage, or let's just say relationships, a tight, intimate relationship, serves a purpose. It serves God's purpose. But that's the purpose of it, is to serve God's purpose. Really, not our own. Not our own. And we forget that, okay? So, there's this big party that's going to be waiting for us, right? Uh, I, I almost didn't put this up there because, you know, I'm talking to an expert over there in Revelations, right? But Revelations talks about this party. Uh, let, let's read this. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is a huge party going on. This is a huge party. Other passages in Scripture, it talks about uh, the wedding banquet. You know, there's this, this image that's being painted of the world beyond, of when we get to heaven, this huge, massive Worship service, party, celebration, all this is awaiting for us. So unless we get like, okay, there's going to be no marriage, there's going to be no wealth, there's going to be no possessions. No, but there's going to be all of this. There's, there's a great party waiting for us, whether we're single or whether we're married. All right? That's, so it's kind of like we all have a common vision before us of what we're looking for and what we're trying to obtain. And that is, that's important. Uh, and it's there for us whether we're coming out of broken relationships or not. I think that's an, it's important for us to realize that because sometimes broken relationships can seem like the end of the world. And they're not. This is what's waiting for us. And we go through all kinds of hardships and trials in this world. But that's what's waiting for us, okay? So we have this big party waiting for us, and it's going to be great. Uh, we're not going to be married one another, we're going to be married to Christ, we're going to be his bride, the church of Christ, and it's awesome, and we have that the way for us, right? But then, do we have to wait for that? Is it like, okay, we just suck, you know, grin and bear it, suck it up, deal with life, because someday we'll die, but then it's all going to be okay? Well, no, not exactly, because there is the now and the not yet. The not yet is that great wedding celebration that we just read about. But here's the now, in Psalm 16. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The presence of God can be with us now. The presence of God can be with us now. We have to wrap our heads around that. We can feel his presence now. Not just know that he's everywhere, not just know that he's there. We can sense the presence of God now. His comfort and love can be very real for us now. Now, last week we read in 1 Corinthians, uh, we broke down 1 Corinthians. I don't think I, I got to it, but at the end of the passage it says, Now we look through a mirror dimly, then we shall see face to face. So there is a reality of that now, okay, we can sense the presence of God. It's going to be a well, relatively weak compared to what it's going to be like at that day. 
But it is real, and it is now. And, and we can see it through a mirror dimly, but we can see it. So here's a couple reminders of exactly how God feels about us, the kind of relationship he wants to have with us, right? In, uh, this is um, uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. Uh, Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? It's like he takes care of birds. How much more does he love you and cherish you? And I think the picture of him is like, I, when I read this, I kind of think of Francis of Assisi. You know, you ever see pictures of him and the birds and all that? And, these, and he cherishes these little things. He loves nature. He loves the animals, right? And you see this picture, and God says, see that beautiful picture of cherishing the animals? That, that, that's me. I love these little creatures I created. Guess what? I love you more. So if you could see that image, multiply that, and that's how I feel about you. This guy, God's painting a little love letter to us, right? And then he goes on to talk about um, the, the, the uh, lilies, the flowers of the field, the lilies of the field. Uh, they, they, um, they do not labor or spin, yet Solomon in all his glory was addressed as one of these. If, God, if that is God, how God clothes the grass of the field, which is today, here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Okay? So, um, yeah, maybe I should add, oh, you of little faith. Right? <laughs> that isn't, that's the problem. That is the problem, right? Uh, we'd like to, I'd like to stop there because I want to read that last little piece, you know. <laughs> but that is the problem. I don't have enough faith. If I had enough faith, I would realize that God takes care of flowers. You, you look at the trees. Look at the mountains. We were out, uh, I, I, I took a picture, of, I, I coached football, we were all the way out in North Adam, Drury, we played Drury coach, and we were all out there, we won, by the way, I knew you were worried about that, yeah, yeah, we won, yeah, we didn't play like we should, but it better to play bad and win than, you know, play well and lose, right, so anyway, um, it was beautiful, it was on the side of this mountain, you looked at all the trees and the mountains, we were up in the Berkshires, it was gorgeous, you know, and and the Lord's saying, okay, all that beauty and splendor, which is basically going to wither away and die, but you're eternal. Your relationship with me is eternal. If I show this beauty and love and, and, and I have this, I cherish all of this, how much more do I cherish you that will be here forever and have a relationship with me forever? So it's, I want to paint this beautiful, like, God has this passion for us, okay? And the, the point is that in this relationship, though our human relationships fail, our relationships may fail, God does not. That's very, very important. We're going to get to that why. It's very important that we realize that God has not failed us. He has not failed us. And though our partner may have left us, God did not. Though we can no longer go to our partner as a source of joy and comfort, we still can go to God if we let him. Hence, O oh, you of little faith. Okay? It's not like, okay, I gotta believe more. I gotta believe more, you know? I do believe in fairies. I do believe in fairies. No, it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not like that. It's like, okay, God, I give in. I, I, I embrace you. I love you. I, teach me how to love you like you love me. That's what it's about. And then you, you act, there actually is this, well, let's read about it. There's actually this exchange of love, peace, and joy that goes on. Uh, in the Psalms, oh, Psalms are great. So Psalm 511, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Again, we see this call to a mutual relationship. Let them who love your name, okay? What does it mean, love your name? It means love your identity, love you. Okay, it's like um, um, a suitor saying to, I, I love your face, or, I, you know, I love your beauty. Or really, the, the point is, I love you. This is a reflection of you, and your name is your identity, and I, I love you and rejoice in you. And what is re, the, the, um, the result of that? Well, we are protected by him, and we feel his joy. It, it ignites a singing within us, Okay. Psalm 21, 6, surely you have granted him unending blessings 
and made him glad with the joy of your presence. Okay? Now, there's, um, there's a contingency here. Okay? What do I mean by contingency? Well, in, it's kind of like an us-them thing in psychology, right? Where you, you talk to somebody about the contingencies of your actions. Okay? You're taking drugs, right? What's the contingency? Well, you take drugs because now I feel good. Okay, let's spread out. So what's the greater contingency? Well, then I lose my job, I lose my family, I, everything, my whole life falls apart, okay? So part of what we're trying to do is let them see the contingencies. Yeah, you have some short-term contingencies, right, that lead to some really nice feelings, and, but then that leads to long-term contingencies that ruin your life. So what's the contingency here, right? The contingency here is that if you have this love relationship with, with God, right, then you sense his presence, and as a contingency of sensing your presence, you're aware of these unending blessings, these eternal blessings, and joy is the result. But there is a contingency. It's like, okay, but if you walk away from God, and you turn your back on him, and you put walls up between you and him, you're not going to get these things, right? And sometimes we paint like, okay, well, God turned his back on me. Now, God hasn't moved. God doesn't change. He's constant. So if, if, if we're feeling a distance, right? I mean, you've heard it before, right? If you're feeling you're, you're, you're far from God, well, who moved, right? Uh, Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song, I praise him. Okay? So now God has given us strength. God has given us protection, hence my shield, okay? And again, the contingency is what? My heart, my passion, my burning desire from what deep within leaps for joy with song, right? And you hear this reference to music whenever we're talking about joy and, and worship. Worship, joy, singing all seem to go hand in hand, right? Because it's a joyful, it's, it's like, um, um, what I heard one pastor say, uh, worship is like kissing God, that is like, that, that's when we worship, we're showing our affection to God. That's what, what's going on. So when we sing, when we sing out here, I know Chris Mitchell, how many, people remember Chris Mitchell, like, of course, most people, right? I, I remember he said, you know, Greg, um, a lot of times I, I hate it when people clap after songs. He said, I hate it. He says, because it's like, who are they clapping? Those people performing? I mean, are we praising God? You know, are we worshiping God, right? What's this supposed to be? We're singing because we're showing affection to God. So... I hope, but I, he says, I know it's true. I, I would wish that if we're clapping, we're clapping to God. Hooray, God, for you. But it's probably not what's happening. We're clapping at a good performance. And he, he, got, he got it, you know, which is why he hated it when people clapped after the songs, right? <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, Psalm 30, uh, 11. You turn my wailing into dancing. This, there's a reason why I kept this one for last. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, okay? The wailing is sorrow. The wailing is the pain. The wail is the cry. And he said, and, and so what, what David said is you, you've taken that and you turn it into joy. Sackcloth is what people put on when they mourned, all right? You've taken off my sackcloth and you clothe me with what? With joy, okay? So there is God's design and his desire for us when we go through sorrows and broken relationships it is not that we come out of it okay we're going to suck it up and we're going to deal with life anyway no he wants us to replace that with dancing and with joy that is his purpose and how do we do it what is the contingency what is it that produces that dancing that joy intimacy with him it's just that simple and just that hard right okay so what next? Okay, we got this in our head. We understand it. We get it. Okay, so now what? Okay, now what? Number one, avoid the trap of blaming God. That is so easy to fall into when we come out of broken relationships or we have any hardship in our life. We blame God, right? It's somebody's fault, right? I actually had a man who um, was, um, he's really grieving his sin, and his sin had developed this really broken relationship with somebody he cares about very much, right? And he looked at me and said, I'm really angry with God. I'm saying, why? Well, why did he let this happen? Why did he let me do that? I said, dude, okay, right there, you got to stop, right? For no other reason that you're going to separate yourself from the very person who can fix this thing for you. 
right? Who can fix your life, who can put it all back together. Don't let that happen. And I, I think I used it last week. I'll use it again, uh, this, uh, this uh, little analogy I came up with. The young couple, they're, they're renting the home. They're trying to make ends meet. They're, they're really sacrificing really hard. And they have an evil landlord who keeps ra raising the rent on them, raising the rent on them, right? So much so that they, they can't make ends meet. They have fights. And the, 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 their marriage is on the fritz. She has an affair with that evil landlord who raised the rent and caused the friction in their marriage to begin with, right? That's kind of like us when we start blaming a God, right? Now, we read in Scripture that there is an enemy, there is Satan, there is a devil. Now, we don't know a lot other than he's probably not some guy with a with, with the horns and a, and a tail and hooven cloth and red and pitchfork and probably not that. But we know he's intelligent. He's um, got a He's uh, like a mob boss. He's got organized crime in the spiritual realm, and he wants to defeat us, and he wants to defeat God, which he can't do. That's the good news. Good news is don't freak out. Don't you know, get over-spiritualized about a lot of stuff. God wins. We, we, we got on God's side. We're okay. But no, when all this stuff happens to us, it's not God doing it. right? There is an enemy who's out to get us. And so when we see that, recognize that, and run to God. Right? Avoid that trap of blaming him, okay? He grieves with us more than we do about sin, about hardship, about pain, everything that's going on, right, in the world. You turn on the news, you're like, how can it be a God when all that's going on? Well, guess what? He's crying about it worse than you are because he knows everything that's going on all the time, and it's so contradictory to his design and what he wants, and it's serve it. he, he has to allow it to happen, because he's, he, he, well, I'm going to go down a rabbit. Let's just say that to develop a love relationship with us, he's given us this ability to choose. But, and I, that's probably another talk, and I'll probably let Cliff handle that, because theologically that'd be nice. more in-depth, right? Yeah. <laughs> but we'll have to do something on that, right? Whether it's bad things happen, right? Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll both we'll do a tag team or something, I don't know. But anyway, um, understand that he agrees, but Jesus God, as man on earth, is the only one who never partook in any of that craziness. Each and every one of us do selfish acts, and we lie, and we cheat, and we've done things to partake, partake in that badness. And there's only one human being who never took part in that badness, and that was Jesus. So think about it. So we're going to go and blame him? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. I'm the only one who ever did anything wrong, and you're blaming me? You know, I mean, that's really what that's about when you start blaming God. Now, my computer, this looked, it, it was a lot clearer than this is, okay? So I'll, I'll read it, right? But here's two passages, and I'll show side by side to give you a little taste of what God is experiencing in sin and in brokenness and in failed relationships, okay? Over here in Genesis, right? That's on the left. The Lord, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So unless you think you're a really good person, uh, you need to reread that a few times, okay? Every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Listen, before you blame God for anything, and actually there's some, some um, versions that said the Lord grieved, grieved that he made man. Like, oh my God, I made these people, and look how much they're killing me. <laughs> look how much they're tearing my heart out. Look how much they're doing to, to hurt me. That's how God looks at our sin, all right? Now, in Hebrews, it says, for we do not have a high priest, the high priest they're talking about is Jesus. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but, he, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Now, if we ever have a class about how God was tempted, I'm definitely letting Cliff do that, okay? <laughs> but the fact is, there it is. There it is. He felt pain. He felt sorrow. We know he felt frustration. He cried out, Lord, how much more do I have to deal with this faithless generation? Right? He had anger. 
right? We saw that. He went in the temple and threw over tables and, and kicked some butt, literally, right? He was tempted in all ways as we are, but did not sin. What does that mean? He never separated himself from the Father. He was in constant contact, constant relationship with the Father, and we should say the Holy Spirit. That oneness was never broken. That oneness that God wants with us, but we break it all the time. That was never broken in Jesus. So, not only do we have someone who can relate, but someone that we can go to and he says, take heart, I've overcome the world. Well, wait a minute, Lord, I'm here suffering. I'm, you overcame it, that's great, you're God, all right? But I'm suffering here. He says, no, 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 I I'm with you and my spirit is in you and I know what you went through. I felt what you felt. I feel what you feel now. Let my presence into your life because I want to be in that with you. And I want to walk through it with you. You're not going to get a better, um, um, a, a better offer than that. <laughs> I mean, that is like the ultimate offer. Let me walk in your pain. <laughs> you know, why? Well, what do you want in return? Just love me. That's all. Just be with me. That's all I want. That's like the best deal we're ever going to get. Now, why don't we take up? What, what, what is it within us that, that holds us back from taking part in this, this, this love offering that God's given us? Well, th there's the thing about pain, right? We, 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 we learn from pain. In fact, some authors say it's the only thing that really does teach us, you know, solidly. But we don't want to come face to face. It's an unfortunate fact that that's how we primarily grow is through pain, but we don't want to see that. We don't want to deal with it. See, as Lewis wrote, uh, pain removes the veil. It plants the flag of truth within the fortress of our rebel soul. In other words, that, that like facade we like to put on, that little, like everything's okay, I got it under control, I got it together. Pain is, got, uh, is well, it's how it's all wiped out. And then the truth that we need God and that we are dependent upon him and that we are weak is planted in that soul, that part of us that wants to pull away from God. And think. Because when we feel like we're in control, when we think we got it together, guess what you're doing? You're saying, I don't need you, God. You're putting the hand up, right? You're putting the wall up. What pain and suffering does is it pulls that wall down and says, no, I need you, God. R Richard Rohr, I don't know if any of you, but there's a book, uh, Falling Upward. I think it's a great book. Have you read that? at all? No? We had, it, we had it out here for a while in the lobby uh, when we had books in the lobby. Anyway, I'd highly recommend it. But he says this, the loss renewal pattern, and he, this is after talking quite a bit about loss and renewal, that our lives are, we grieve and God restores us. We lose and then God renews us, okay? There's this pattern in life of suffering and then being made whole and restoration. And it's a pattern that goes on throughout our life. And he says, this loss and renewal pattern is so constant and ubiquitous that I should hardly call it a secret at all. Yet it is still a secret, probably because we do not want to see it. <laughs> How true is that? It's like, he goes on to say, if you look at every great person, anyone that you would admire, Abraham Lincoln, Mother Teresa, just go right down the line, Winston Churchill, they've had some horrific lives. If you ever read the life of Abraham Lincoln, oh my gosh, did that man suffer? Mother Teresa, they, they, they're pulling out uh, letters now. She just cried out to God, where are you? How come I, you know, the intense suffering that they went through. Any great person who achieved anything of great worth has suffered, right? Now, you could probably say, well, everyone has suffered. Just some people turn that into greatness, <laughs> right? And some people do not, all right? So... Allow God to renew us through a more intimate relationship with him. That is the bottom line. If there is one big idea we could take. I mean, I got to admit, when I saw this about brokenness, right, and, and broken relationships and when relationships fail, do a talk on relationships fail, all right? Because you're a psychologist. You know all this stuff, right? <laughs> it's like we're like the Mikeys. Remember that commercial Mikey? Oh, give the Mikey. He'll lead everything, right? Well, give it a psychologist. He'll talk on anything, right? Because <laughs> he's dealing with messes all the time, right? Yeah, and you know, it's funny because I, 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 was, I was thinking through this. Like when relationships fail, what do we do? What is the answer? Is there an answer? You know, they fail and you move on, right? But no, there's a, no, there's, there's a difference because it taps into the use of pain in our life, 
how God uses pain in our life. It uses us to draw us closer to him, which is the point of every single one of us. So when our relationships fail, whether it's between spouses, whether it's, be, uh, whether it's a romantic relationship at all, whether it's uh, uh, an estrangement between children and a parent, uh, brother and sister, brother and brother, friends, whatever it is, the pain of that brokenness, if we cling to God, there's a value in a restoration of, and, and maybe even an increase, a renewal of that intimacy with him. Psalm 143, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Okay, it's making that statement more and more real in our life that, that, that will bring us that restoration out of failed relationships. All right, so in closing, um, the story. So... There was a woman that my wife and I met. When we met her, she, she shared the story how she came to Christ. And one uh, morning, she thought she had a good uh, marriage. She came out and saw a note on the kitchen table. And basically her husband said, I'm going for a ride on a motorcycle. I'm not coming back. She never saw him again. She got papers and mail for the divorce and all that. I mean, it crushed her. She, she got blindsided. She never saw it coming. She thought they had a really cool relationship. He wanted out. She never knew. He just got on the bike someday, took off. She, she was crushed, crushed. Through that, um, some family members, some friends shared, sharing the gospel with her. She started relying on God more and more, and she gave her life to Christ and clung to him. So when we met her, we met her in church, and either she was getting engaged or got engaged to this really good Christian guy, and they had a good relationship. We became friends with both of them. And then at one point, it came out that he was having a relationship with another woman, another Christian woman. And so when it came to the light, he said, dude, you can't have two. Right? This isn't, you know, old time Jerusalem or whatever, right? It's like you got to choose, right? Well, a man and one, so he chose the other woman. Demoralized her. Just totally crushed her, not just once, but two, crying out to God, how could this be happening? How could this happen to me? Lord, I give my life to you, you know? Isn't everything supposed to be better? Not. That's another 301 talk, right? <laughs> Things don't all get better, right? But, um, but so in her intense pain, she prayed and meditated like she never did before. And basically, God said, all those things you want from a husband, let me get back to it. Though that refuge you want in that. You know how like our, our marriage, we come home to our, our, our spouse, and that's our refuge. That's our haven, right? Uh, the blessings and joy we get from their presence, the, the strength that we feel from that relationship, the, the sense of joy and dancing, right? And by the way, any of us who are married, we know, okay, yeah, that's half the time. <laughs> the other half is very much the opposite of all that, right? And, and, and that dance is really going between the struggle of love and forgiveness and, and fighting and forgiveness and love and pain, and, right? That's what marriage really is all about, right? But whatever this is, so our friend, right, reading this and contemplating on it, realized, okay, where you were looking for a marriage to get all that, you get it from me. And she realized, God is my husband. God is my husband. And she declared that, God is my husband. Well, sometime later, she met another friend of mine, and they got along real well, and they got married. And last year, Marianne and I went to the wedding of their son. All right? Now, I always didn't want to share that last part because I don't want this to become a formula. Oh, okay, so I give my life to God, and in the end, I'll get married and have the guy, and we're going to get married, you know. And uh, because I, I, I also know about those 25 years in between of <laughs> doing some counseling with them and working through issues and everything else that goes on in life because that's life. That's life. It's not just happily ever after. Yeah, that revelation thing, yes. Yeah, then. Now we struggle. Now we struggle because we are fallen creatures, I can say this here, it's 301, right? We're fallen creatures. We, we constantly have this tension of clinging to God and pulling away from Him and clinging to Him and pulling away from Him. And hopefully collectively as a church, we cheer each other on to cling more. But also because we're fallen creatures, we also will 
our relationships will tempt us to back off more. But that's part of God is steady. God is constant. The bottom line and the end game is we cling to him, right? He, that's how we get through broken relationships. That's how we thrive when relationship seems like failure, right? So let me just uh, say a prayer so that if people need to go, they go. But then I'll, we got 15 minutes, so I'll stick around after for dialogue. Anyway, well, Lord, you know that, uh, you know, how far short we fall on this stuff. But also, Lord, we uh, somehow we know how much you delight in us. You delight in having a relationship with us. You delight in us, Lord, and that's just amazing. So, Lord, I, I, I pray and I know each and every one of us here wants to cling to that part, the part where you cling to us. And we want to hold on and we want you to, to teach us, show us, and motivate us from within to have that passion, to hold on to you, and to never let go. And let it start today. Let it start now. And, uh, Lord, let it just always start and begin with you. In thy name we pray. Amen. Okay. Comments, questions, stories. I'll jump in. We'll go. You, you go well, first. I just have a question. Um, last week I was on the retreat, so during the week I looked for the 301 to hear it, and I couldn't find it. So you gave me the link that only went to the one you did the week before. Yeah. So I went. So I, I didn't know. Was there a way to hear it? Yeah. It's on there. It's on there. It's on what? That same link? It, it's near there. So if you go, okay. So uh, the other way. <laughs> Uh, the way I, I get to them is I go on um, the NEC website, yeah. and I think resources is what you or you hit sermons. Uh, I think it's resources, and then it's like faith questions. Or 301, something like our, that. Our you got to look for it. It's resources, okay. and then you look for, I think you're looking for uh, 301 or something okay. like that. I'll try that. Thank yeah, you. they make you do a little uh, problem solving kind it, of thing. It is 301. It is 301. Just click on 301, 301 and it'll show you the list. That should be the list. Yeah. yeah. Because all I saw was like, view details, sign up, add it to my calendar. Yeah, no, three, so re yeah, resources, resources, 301, and then there'll be the list of all the different teachings, and then just look for the one you want. Thank you. Okay, Cliffy, your turn. Oh, they, all right. So, yeah, you, you mentioned a lot about um, just being in the presence of God and, and uh, working on our relationship with Him and, uh, I get, this is partly a question to you, but also to the uh, the brain trust here. We uh, how, like how do we do that? I think is the question, right? Is mm -hmm. if, you know if that's the one relationship that where God doesn't leave, and that's the one if we put our effort in, we we know we're going to get something back out of it. Mm -hmm. Like how do we make that relationship better? Right. So uh, the what was on my mind, and again, I'd like people to jump in because there's, there's different ways, right? people have been at these amazing worship services and I felt the presence of God and, and you know which is great but for me it's the prayer without ceasing you know I ask people right how often should we pray how often does the Bible say we should pray right and the answer is don't stop <laughs> you continually pray pray without ceasing well how do you do that you know you can't you can't live life on your knees, right? So obviously praying isn't just going into a quiet room or getting on your knees and, and praying. Now that's good. So the way I like to look at it is like in relationships, right? You have time with your wife that you just want to go out and have dinner, just the two of you, and a nice intimate time together, just the two of you, right? That's like your quiet times. That's the time like when you go off with God and just you and him and his word, but even you're reading the word more for him to speak to you through it as opposed to studying it like in some theological way but throughout the day like it, my, my wife and I could spend a day today we'd go visit the grandkids we could do things today there's that and uh, her presence I'm going to be aware of her presence and her presence probably going to shape my behavior and from time to time I might ask her opinion or I might just look at her and she'll give me a nod or something like that we are interacting all day long if we spend today together doing different things shopping visiting going other places you know um, Sometimes we'll be in a big room, right? And she's over there talking to someone. I'm over there talking, and we make eye contact, right? Like, oh, yeah, you know, there's that recognition. That's what it's like praying without ceasing. Like, you're aware of God's presence all the time. And your awareness of his presence shapes your behavior. And I've been in board meetings. I'm like, oh, Lord, what do I do now? You know, and 
<laughs> he's telling me, you know. I, I tell you why, uh, I've mentioned this to some of you, why psychologists have beards. You know, so you rub it and go like this, like you look very contemplative and like, oh dear God, tell me what to say, I don't have a clue. You know, <laughs> it's true. And you know what? He always tells me, he always gives me something to say. It's, it's amazing, you know, and I know it's him because it sounds ridiculous, but yet it works, you know, so um, there's that constant interaction with him. You're driving the car, you're thinking about it. Just the other day, I was really angry about something and I started praying and God said, you're thinking about it all wrong. Think about it this way. And then the peace just came over me. Like, you can't, it's kind of like you can't leave the mafia, you know, like, because you know too much. I couldn't leave Christ, I can't leave Christ because I know too much. It's like when you have experiences like that, you can't deny his reality. You're like, I'm driving a car and I'm really angry. I mean, I'm angry about somebody and I'm praying and he says, you're thinking about it wrong. Like, where does that come from? It came from him, right? He's correcting me. And then that peace that passes all understanding, you know, that presence of God. That, so that's what I was talking about. You know, there's this Shekinah glory that people witness and, and worship. And, and if, I, if I'm honest, I've witnessed that too. It's amazing. Like, whoa, it just blows you away. But what I'm talking about in terms of relationships here, I'm talking about just that, the ongoing discussions with him, that ongoing awareness that he's there and he's guiding you and he's leading you. Okay? So uh, when you were speaking earlier about the marriage and how it should better serve God together than mm -hmm. you would by yourself. Do you think that's something that um, would happen right away, or is that something that it grows into? Both. Okay. Yeah, both. So, love. Do you love, per do you love somebody when you get married? Yes. Does that love grow? Hopefully. Right? You know. So, uh, I was going to use my marriage as an example of my wife's in the back. I don't want to embarrass her, you know. <laughs> Uh, but you do look more beautiful today than you did when I met you, honey, and you were gorgeous then, so uh -huh. that's what I was going to say. Okay, there you go, I said it, yeah, sorry, no. I just met you, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe 20 years from now, Chris, I'll say that too about you. <laughs> but since I just met you, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that, right? There's that love relationship, and like, you know, and sometimes some of us come on gradually to the Lord, you know, and, and uh, people who grew up in Christian homes say, you know, I never remember not loving God. It's just always a part of my life. And some people have these amazing, miraculous conversion experiences, you know, I'm like, wow, I was so in love with God and it just came on me. But then you have to grow from there. Yeah. You can't leave it there, right? That's like in America, it's just, um, oh, what's the word that's escaping me? Uh, not Infatuation, right? Then if it just stagnates there, then it's just infatuation. It's not real love. And love is the grinding out the day-to-day -day hardships and pains and forgiveness and working through that stuff, so. Anything else? Wow, we'll get to service on time today. Yeah. All right, well, I'm around. If you got questions and things come to your mind, just grab me, you'll see me. All right, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Thank you.